absolutely wonderful. And one of the questions I would like to ask you is how do you display this candy museum at home? Because it's absolutely wonderful. It's, it's so huge as well. Well, this is the first time that I've shown the museum to the public, and I usually have it for private viewings only. And we display it on shelves, and we have museum lighting and some curtains that are sometimes kept closed and we'll open them for the oh, private viewing. Oh, that's spectacular. And which room is this in the it's house? It's in the living room. Oh, spectacular. But most of the time you keep that hidden and just for certain guests? That's right. Oh, that's fabulous. That makes it more private. People feel more special. Yes. If you open it just for them. And I feel very special being able to look at these wonderful exhibits. This is one of my favorites. This is the Love Dog. It, it looks like uh, it's made from china or plastic, but it's all made from candy. It really does. Can I hold that? Yes, you may. Oh, look at it. That looks like a plastic dog, doesn't it? Would you really think that was made with sugar? And it's made, here's his own bones. It's, it's made in Japan. We actually got this one in Japan town, but um, I've gotten many of my, most of my uh, candies from Japan I actually got in Japan. This one actually came from Japan town. Um, this is another favorite, uh, peas and carrots. Peas and American. carrots, that's very cockney, isn't it? Peas and carrots. Watch your peas, American, watch your peas and cues. Oh, it's not, it's American, sorry. But the candy is American. <laughs> uh, here's another Japanese one I got in Kyoto, and it's a seasonal candy. It's like a bento box with azuki rice and azuki beans with rice and vegetables. So it's a little snack. There's an egg. And what does what the candy Lego taste like? This is delicious. It tastes like um, Smarties, sort of sweet and sour flavor. Those are very good. One of the few things actually in the museum that tastes good. So let's, let's have a look at this other one here. This is, this is a tiny little operation game. Yes, they're actually uh, gum, chiclets. And here's a kuti game and the game of Clue, uh, everybody's favorite board game, Clue. Clue, oh, that's like... In the, in the dining room with the candlestick with Mrs. Muffet or mm -hmm. Miss Scarlet. <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. And some of this gum, here's some gum I got in Morocco. Coffee oh, gum. Oh, let me see that. It's coffee gum. How coffee lovely. Gum. That'll keep you awake. And uh, this is funny, unless Brooklyn gum from Italy. Oh. So I didn't get it in Brooklyn. In fact, they don't even make it in Brooklyn. Yes, keep this in the, keep this in the family forever. I started in 1994, it was actually with my grandmother at a Toys R Us, and um, I was standing in line, we were buying a puzzle, because we used to do puzzles, and, and I looked over and I saw a wall full of Pez dispensers, and I was like, okay, this is it, I'm collecting Pez dispensers. And the first one I got was a Tweety, and I had, I had 20 of them right off the shelf there, and then since then I've been obsessed. When, was, when did Pez dispensers start? Well, they actually came over from Austria in the late 40s um, by uh, the Haas company. And they originally were mints, were mints okay. in, um, in Austria. Hence, Pez can, comes from peppermints. They started first with a Santa, a Popeye, and a Mickey Mouse. Wow. And then um, they started doing die cuts, so you can wow. actually see on the side of the dispenser. Can you see that? And give me an idea how many Pez collectors are there out there? Oh, there's oh, thousands. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And what's amazing even more is that every Pez collector has their different ones that are very special to them. Um, this is actually one of my favorites um, because of its style and, and because of the die cut on the side. Right. I love this, uh, the Las Vegas version of the Tasmanian mm -hmm. Devil. 
Do you know anything about that? <laughs> yeah, actually, there was a there was a fellow who made a couple of dispensers like that. Um, I purchased one of them. Oh, so this is a customized yes, one. Yes, I see. Someone made that. Really nice. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Hulk. Mm -hmm. Looks like you have old and newer version. It looks like the older ones didn't have a foot. Yeah, well, it's actually interesting. The, the older ones didn't have a foot, but they actually sold feet that you could put them into. They were like little stands. Oh, really? And, um, and then they, they developed the feet, developed a mold with the feet. Um, that changed with the new, with a new patent. There were four patents over the years um, for different dispenser types. And then also differences in, in age is um, the amount of pieces that were on the actual dispenser. So if you look on, on the Mickey Mouse, there's actually, um, on the face, the whole face part lifts off. You could pull it right off. Wow. Um, whereas with the new one, it's all one piece with painted right. pieces on it. And with each dispenser, it changes the amount of pieces that are on the dispenser so that um, it cuts down on costs. And how much is one of these older original Pez dispensers worth? Well, this Mickey Mouse sells for approximately $150 to $200. Wow. Yeah. And did you eat all the Pez that came in these? <laughs> Actually, I used to give them out to friends quite often. <laughs> I, would, I would make a little bowl in, in, my, uh, in my bedroom, and then whenever someone came in, I would just be like, here, take some Pez. And is there a sp very specific Pez dispenser that you would just do anything to have? There is one. There, there are a couple actually. The, the most, the rarest Pez dispenser is a Make a Face Pez dispenser, and it was made, it was put out for a couple of months and was taken off the shelves because it had thirty little pieces that came with it. Wow, and like kids Mr. Were Potato Head. It or was something. exactly like Mr. Oh, Potato wow. Head, and it came with a bare face, and you could put the little pieces on the face and make oh, your own that face. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, and those sell for around two or three thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, but my favorite that I would absolutely love to get would be a Zorro. And Zorro. on the side of the dispenser, it actually says Zorro in his cool. little Z. I have to say, Pez candy is one of my least favorite candies, but the dispensers are so cute that they're still, you know, you still want to buy it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> for that reason alone. Well, thanks for bringing your collection of Pez dispensers. Of course, thank for you. All of us to enjoy. It would be very difficult to live in a minimal style for me. It's just <laughs> not my forte. Uh, I could never, ever do it. I've always had myself surrounded by things and fun, interesting things. And uh, I have a difficult time understanding the minimalist movement. It just isn't there for me. <laughs> We just enjoy being in this environment. It's, uh, everybody has their, their own things that they collect and they really love. And uh, if you place them around you, they make sense. When it comes to the toys, we like things that are made of tin. We have uh, quite a few trains. We have about 18 toy trains. The tin cars, tin buildings. Uh, a lot of the children's kitchen toys are in the kitchen. It seemed right to put them there. Yeah, we have little stoves and refrigerators and things. Some of the things started as things that we actually had from childhood that have carried through our lives. Others have been recollecting things that we did have that got cast aside by parents and multiple moves and things like that. 
and others are just ones that really turned us on when we saw them and we decided that we really wanted to add them to our collection. Uh, the, as far as the toys go, a couple of the trains uh, were mine as a child. Uh, uh, I was raised to where I had uh, my Sunday toys. I, I, my family wasn't affluent like Ryan's were. So I had toys that I could play with in the house on Sunday and then I had other toys that I could play outside with. My inside toys survived and uh, I have them. Um, so some of those have a, a lot of uh, sentimental value to me. I have uh, an old doll that belonged to my mother that was given to her by a great great aunt. Uh, it's from around the 1870s or 80s and uh, it's again one of my favorite pieces. Our workroom has Mickey Mouse. And it's not necessarily all stuff that Disney approved or would have approved. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Mickey was something that uh, always brought a smile to uh, our faces, and uh, so getting up and walking through this place, it's a, it's a happy apartment because of it. Uh, plus, um, Disney and the Mickey Mouse Club, of course, uh, was when I was a child, uh, had a big influence on me, and uh, I really liked the idea of Mickey Mouse being uh, a commercial success, not just a toy. Lunch boxes. Uh, a lot of people will identify with those. Everybody that goes down that hallway says, "Oh, I had this and this TV program and all this kind of jazz." Because, you know, uh, during the '60s, '70s, and so on, uh, uh, that was it, that was a big thing. Uh, if you had a, something that was successful, you had a lunchbox made from it. <laughs> so it's just uh, kind of like memory lane, a little bit of that. We have uh, over 120 of them and uh, a lot of them are on display, and a lot of them are in storage. Actually, I bought 80 of them at one time, and that's what started uh, everything going. Uh, <laughs> we probably would have a lot more, but uh, room didn't dictate us buying every one that we saw. So... <laughs> <laughs> I started uh, collecting the money. It was before Brian and I met. I was living in New York City, and uh, the Chase Manhattan Bank had a, a money museum on Times Square. And uh, they, it closed down, and uh, a lot of their collections were farmed out to uh, uh, different shops and so on. And across from Tiffany's on 57th Street was uh, uh, a shop, and uh, that's where I bought my first piece of Odd and Curious money. And uh, it's been uh, <laughs> continuous since then. <laughs> we go to galleries, we go to uh, coin shows, we find things at flea markets, uh, garage sales. You, you pick up pieces that are over a thousand years old and you wonder, you know, who held these and so on and so forth. And, what was the transaction they were used for? primitive art, I have uh, certain pieces that are just, you know, the cat's meow. I, I pick them up and just hold them. And basically the spirits of uh, the, the person that passed away resides in these figures. Uh, in fact, there's a few of the figures that we're totally endeared to by holding them and so on. You just feel a warmth from them. They're, they're quite livable. We really like having them around us. They're like company. <laughs> Some pieces, if they're placed somewhere, just tell you they have to be moved. We share the apartment with uh, our big fat dog, Ruby, our cat, Jack, uh, our two tor turtles, uh, Renee and Pat, and our friends. That's true. <laughs> Skeleton here, too. <laughs> The, the animals uh, started all in fun. Uh, we had a land tortoise. And we went to the flea market. My mother bought us a stuffed tortoise. Uh, 
Then we had to get a stuffed squirrel that we saw, because everybody should have a squirrel in the house. Uh, and then came the chicken. And then a friend of ours shot this bear, and uh, he couldn't live with it. It hung on his wall, and so it fits great in our fireplace there. The bear rug was just a, a find, and uh, face it, everybody's got to have one so your friends can take their baby pictures on it. The boar said it had to come home because every house needs a boar, too. The stuffed pig uh, was appropriate in the kitchen. Um, the, the goat with the, the goatee that's been uh, braided. And then there was the anomaly pig. Uh, everybody should have an anomaly in the house with an extra appendage or two. Uh, things that are nice and normal. things from nature and that's where um, I get a lot of these ideas from. So did you make did you make these things? Are these things you made yourself? These are all things oh, I've well, made. Oh isn't that fantastic? Not only a collector but she's making them. That's an art. An obsession of sorts. Yes. yes. And where does this obsession, where's the deep root of this <laughs> obsession? Where does it come from? Well um, the home I grew up in had a lot of simulated things from nature. Um, a waterfall that plugged into this balcony that my mom had that overlooked our living room and um, a lot of fake wood grain, uh, a lot of veneer. So like, so like this picture, there's veneer on this picture, it's lovely, it's like that old 70s. You must be pretty old if you grew up in the I'm 70s. I'm very old, yeah. yes, yes. Um, with this embroidery <laughs> as well. Yes, and, and just, you know, and, and then the craft element too, like the idea of making something for your home to decorate your home, I like that whole idea. So tell us a bit more about these things your mother made. Well, she kind of, I was inspired by her because she would take our fireplaces, which we didn't use to light fires, she would make these dioramas, these jungle scenes. Oh, that's or fantastic. She'd fill them with ceramic lions and little frogs and uh, hang beads in front of them, and they were very mysterious little vignettes or little sets kind of that she would build. That's fabulous. Let's let's talk a little bit more about these these stumpies. Look at look at these tree stumpies, all knitted. <laughs> Everyone does that. To they that. do? Yes. It's yeah. They're kind of cute together as a little couple. And how do you display these at home? Well I do like to just keep them on the couch kind of piled up like bolster pillows of sorts. Right or and, and so you don't get neck strain. That's fabulous. You can kind of use, my cat likes to um, make biscuits on them. And I picked yes. this plant because it looks like a brain. Everything looks like something else. And, and so you did this with a woodcut tool. And this, yes. is, this is actually ceramic. Yes. And ceramic glaze, ceramic. And then you watertight. These are wonderful. Do you ever sell this? Do you sell this? Tool? I do. Um, I have a small ceramic business. I call it Wood is Good. Wood is Good. And it's all things log, log clocks and log planters That's and uh, log bowls. So I think we can just about wrap up that. It's absolutely Great. wonderful. This is a lovely art collection of tree stumpies. <laughs>
back at Geek Cheek with Andy, our resident bag collector. Thank you. So, what can you tell me about your amazing collection of thank you bags? Well, uh, there are 48 bags on display this evening uh, from my collection of about 200. Uh, I've chosen, of course, only the best to be displayed tonight. And um, I have two different wings of my collection. One is the floral motif, and one is the text-only motif. And I guess there's a little row of happy face bags up at the top. And do you only collect plastic bags? Yes. Do you have any with foreign languages? I have one bag uh, from India, but uh, I'm actually only really concerned with the English bags at this point, because it seems like there are far more uh, varieties in right. terms of like the English bags than anything else. Well, there certainly is a plethora of ways to say thank you, as I can see. Truly, truly. But you can tell that the floral motif is uh, the most effective. We have uh, over 25 variations of the floral motif. But I and, feel uh, a more heartfelt thanks with the smiley face thanking me for my patronage. Well, that's good. I mean, there's something for everyone in the world of uh, appreciation. I mean, you have, like you say, many ways to say thank you. And um, I just hope that when people look at my collection, they feel that incredibly warm sensation that the local store wants to convey by telling you thank you for buying this little piece of meaningless crap at their store. I mean, because it's really important to let people know how how much you appreciate their their money. And you mentioned earlier that you can make clothing out of your bags. Yes, uh, interesting note. These bags are actually called t-shirt style plastic bags. That's the name of the type of bag. Very because easy. Because it's shaped like a sleeveless t-shirt? Absolutely. And it's very easy to convert it into an actual piece of clothing by cutting off the bottom and slipping it over your body and pulling it down around your chest. So these should be distributed to the homeless, perhaps. They could be. They're very they're durable. They keep the water uh, not only off your body, but between the bag and your right. skin. Very effective. So how do you do you have these on display at your home? Uh, I do have a few on display in my home, but most of them are packed away safely in a secure containment Climate facility. Control. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And what's what's the general reaction to your bag collection? from the average person. Uh, people want to tell me how much they enjoy them and I, I just simply say thank you. Is there a special bag out there that you're really coveting? I did see a bag on the street just a few blocks from here one day that was a rose with green petals. And I've never seen that before. And uh, I was prevented from taking it because it was full of dog shit. Uh, that sounds like a bag from a more upscale store that can afford dual printing. I think so. I think it probably was. But I'm always on the lookout for that next level of uh, thank you bag technology. Well, Andy, I have to say I've never seen a plastic bag collection before besides the, the bag full of bags we have hanging on the doorknob waiting to get recycled. But it puts it in a whole new light seeing them displayed this way with all the detail, the variety. It's amazing. Thanks for sharing it with us. You're welcome. <laughs> Tell me, Lauren, why would you start collecting, collecting. lint? Well, it's an ugly job, and somebody had to do it. <laughs> no, actually, um, I was working on a project. I work in sculpture, and I was working on a project of making um, objects out of lint. Um, like o over in the other part of the gallery, there's this object I made. I was sort of like making famous works of art out of lint. So I have the homage to Merritt Oppenheim, you know, the fur teacup right. made out of lint. Very and a nice. variety of other little things. And then I sort of moved on to other projects, except my family wouldn't let me move on. They kept saving the lint, and I didn't have the heart to tell them I didn't want it anymore. So they were sending me, I mean, they were spending money and mailing it to me and mailing a lot of it. And then my mother's <laughs> friends, they were collecting it, and I just felt really bad. So I just kept hoarding it. Now you yeah. put it into kind of color-coded balls here. Yeah, so there's a 
variety of different kinds of balls. Like these are from what I call the Rocky Road collection. This is from people who do their laundry without cleaning out their pockets first. So as you can see, we have some little like certs breath mints in this one. Lots of weird little Kleenexes and scary things. Like I don't know what that's from. Right. I don't know. And then I have what I call my discrete color collection. So um, some, you know, most lint is this kind of like grayish purple, grayish lavender, right. bluish kind of color. But then periodically you get this really amazing stuff. And this is from, I've got three wonderful little dogs and they like to sit on this yellow chenille blanket on the couch. And that thing puts out fuzz and lint like there's no tomorrow. And so probably this is, some dog hair in here as yes, well. Yes, exactly, yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, this is um, a discreet color. It's the golden ochre yellow color. And it's actually very relaxing making these into little balls. So you can pick it up and it's very comforting. Yes, it is. Doesn't it feel make you feel warm and fuzzy it's and happy. just enough solidity. I know, but enough fuzz and right, it gives. It's soft, very nice. Yes. Supple. Now this, this is a ball of lint. This is what we call, yes, the big kahuna. <laughs> the big kahuna Look of this lint. Way. Wow, yeah. that's even pretty heavy. Yes, it is actually pretty heavy. I'm afraid it's going to start to go flat under its own weight. It's like one of those giant pumpkins you have to keep rolling <laughs> so it doesn't get like completely flat and distorted. <laughs> and is this the biggest ball of lint you have? Well, there's actually another one over on the table over there that I would say is about 85% the same size as this one. This is what I call the, um, the uh, a multi-blend, whereas the other one's what I call the classic gray. Right. You know? so, so do you have some future plans for, for lint? lint? Well, I don't know. After this, I'm kind of rethinking my collection. I better get back on it, you know? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so maybe I better start laying the groundwork for the Lint Museum. You exactly, know? The, I know. the Candy Museum. I know, I better get on it, right. It has and display everything else. Now right. we have had Lint, and I have right. to say, I have never heard of a Lint collector. Collection. Right. And do you always walk around now, with your you, little Lint yes. uh, collectors? Well? This is what we say don't leave home without it. Right, a tree. You're around your house. At my house, yes, exactly. Well, thanks for joining us, Lauren. Thank you, it's fun to be here. things in multiple. I love things that shake. It's perfect. Well, that's that's absolutely perfect. So, is there one here was, which was the first one you bought? Show us the first one you bought. Well, that the first one I bought would be this one. Let's hold that up and have a look. Oh, which is, that's, that's amazing. Which is Williamsburg. Williamsburg, VA. Virginia. 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 Not the person, uh, but the uh, place. And but that's not but the first one you own. That, this is the first I bought. The first I owned, this was a gift during the holidays, and this is a, a, a reindeer gift. So what else have we got? We got this lovely nun. This lovely nun, she's beautiful, like like the sound of music. And everything must have balance, so we have hell. We and do have hell is, represented. Oh yes, then we've got hell. Heaven so and hell. We like a bit of Heavenly India. and hellish. Oh, that's supposed to be San Francisco. And, well, this is New York, and I thought this was very unique. Um, and it does have the Twin Towers still there. Oh, goodness is, gracious. So, you know. It's, oh, they're right there, look. But, Fabulous. And it I, does I, actually snow in New York. It does actually snow in yes. New York. Yes. As opposed to hell where it does not snow. No. So. so this one's a San Francisco one, isn't it? This is San Francisco, and I especially like this one because San Francisco is listed upside down, printed upside down. And it's, oh, of course, you know, San Francisco. And this is kind of an, an upside down kind of, kind of place, so yes, I appreciate yes. that. Uh, we like that. So I like this one. And then um, here we have oh, Las Vegas, Las Vegas Viva, which is, this is a Las classic. Vegas, Viva, Las Vegas, Viva. Glitter, of course, it does not snow in Las Vegas either. So we have There's only one dice. 
Or die. Is it a die or a dive? Oh, it's I, a dive. I think the other is trapped in the back. Oh, it's trapped. Yeah. How are you supposed to win so anything? I, I, so this is a really big dust mine. It's not like a usual snow globe. It's, it's pretty. It's, it doesn't even have anything that shakes. It's just this big no snow. fight that gets, gets really hard when it gets it close. Yes. Plastic. Several in my collection are related to movies, and this has been the movie Twister. So and, go ahead, shake and it. And if you twist it, it, it will make a tornado right there before ah! your eyes. This is so fantastic. Well, do it again. Ah, that's good. I mean, I can see something that is wonderful that somebody else just grabbed right from right in front of me, and I will have that, that one moment in a thrift shop of wanting to throw them down on the ground and take it for myself, but then I'll say, calm down, one day you'll find it. If it's meant to be, you will find it. Oh, she's Bubbles. I'm sorry, this is Blossom. This is Bubbles, and I suddenly can't remember her name. I'm Trina Robbins, and I'm an eclectic collector. I collect everything, I can't help it. Well, I don't really collect everything. I collect things that suit my fancy and that tickle my fancy. I like little figurines, I like vintage things. I collect vintage aprons. Uh, I collect vintage clothing also. Um, vintage uh, linen in general, I have some rather nice tablecloths. Old comics, old co original comics pages, uh, action figures of superheroines and ceramic figurines of, of women, but not always women, sometimes cute animals. Certainly I love Art Deco um, cats and panthers. Ceramic tchotchkes is about the best way to describe them, little creamers and, and dishes, popeware, queensware. Um, just the very beginning of a Kennedy Ware collection, one plate. I call myself a feminist pop culture historian, so my collection has to do with pop culture and with women. It's, that's my interest, is, is feminist pop culture. It's what I write my books about. Mostly in the room where I work are the things that kind of inspire me the most, that are based on, on what I do. So I have a lot of... Um, superheroine action figures or just girl action figures. I mean, I have Wonder Woman and I have um, Xena, but I also have the Powerpuff Girls, but they're all strong girl images. Of course, everyone who knows me knows how much I adore Wonder Woman. Um, so I now am probably the only person in the United States with not one but two Wonder Woman cake pans because two separate friends of mine found Wonder Woman cake pans at flea markets and said Trina must have this. Oh, the bathroom figurines of course are made of rubber. They're toys. They're rubber bathtub toys actually and that's why they're in the bathroom. And they're just, well, I've got two Cupies, and I've got a couple of Donald Ducks and a couple of Mickey Mouse. I have a wonderful Wonder Tot, not Wonder Woman, but Wonder Tot. And she was on, I, I had this friend whose boyfriend had one of those wonderful cars with things glued on it. You know those great cars? I think they're called art cars or something, I don't know. And I went to her house one day and his car was parked in front and there was this wonder tot glued on the car and I said, oh my God, where did you get that incredible wonder tot? And he said to Angela, I knew Trina would like that and he just took it off the car and gave it to me. But I kind of tend to group them together like, like this Chinese maiden that I bought in China, this wonderful Maoist um, Red Guard maiden, and I brought her home and, and put her up on my mantle and then this wonderful Chinese guy in my dancing class gave me a Mao and they look so good together of course they gr they're grouped together in fact I have Mao's little red book I ought to tuck it behind them to, to make the display perfect this is the tiki room and in fact these are all my old books on Hawaii behind the hula girls 
This guy is standing there on the corner. People are passing him by. So I knew he was meant for me, so I took him and brought him home. Now, a Catholic friend of mine have to has told me he was Lazarus, but I found out something else about him, and that is that he's also a Santeria saint. And the Santeria saint, or maybe Santeria, however that's pronounced, is Babaluaye, the god. And he was waiting for me on the street corner. And if you know your... Um, your pop culture, you know that Baba Luaye was the song that Ricky Ricardo sang. Ricky Ricardo. Desi Arnaz, of course. R-I-C-K-Y-C-C, -C -C. like in Cuba. I mean, I have so many aprons that I can actually coordinate them to my outfit. So if I'm wearing brown, there's the brown apron. If I'm wearing pink, I mean, just look at, look at that. My inspiration for the vintage aprons was Powell's Bookstore in Portland, and their cafe is decorated with vintage aprons. They have vintage aprons up on the wall of their cafe, and I thought, what a good idea. And of course, then what happened, because it's kind of cosmic, is I immediately started finding vintage aprons really, really cheap. Plus, I wear them when I cook. It protects your clothes. So I have them up on the wall. I have them, I use them as curtains. The really filmy ones make great curtains in the kitchen windows. If I'm having a friend over, um, I certainly like to, to say, use my popeware. You know, I, I can put the cookies in the big pope dish, and the little pope dishes are individual. I get one and she gets one. Uh, it's too bad I don't have Pope cups to go with it, but we can always use our Queen Elizabeth cups, or, or my Queen, I call that my Queen's wear, or my Queen Mum cup, which is even better. I try very, very hard not to be a hoarder. That's why I get rid of things. That's why I keep honing my collection down and just keeping the cream and putting the rest up on eBay. Um, I, I guess I am a collector, but I am not a pack rat or, rat or a hoarder. And I will never be like the famous Collier brothers whose, whose collection fell on them and killed them. You do know that story. Anthony has a collection of space age toys, robots, spaceships, space guns. What's the thing with space? Well, ever since <laughs> I was a young kid, I had a, a born in the 50s, I had a real fascination with space. And actually the first toy I got that I can remember when I was five years old was a little like kind of like this sort of ray gun, which I still have today. Uh-huh. So over the years I've been collecting toys and trying to stay within the Japanese 50s, 40s period. So all of these were made in Japan? All of my toys, yeah. Cool. And you have, what, maybe 50 pieces 60 here tonight? 50 pieces here tonight. And is that I your whole about, collection? No, no, oh. I have about 100 pieces. Wow. This is Mr. Mercury. Mr. Mercury. And Mr. Mercury is from 1951. Wow. He's made by Linmar Toys of Japan. And he bends, he walks, and he picks stuff up and he lights up. Wow. And uh, I really like this flying saucer. Yeah, that's another product of Limars. And he spins and he lights up. Oh, right. And, he, and his hands move as he drives and controls. This is from 1949, I believe. Wow. I don't know the manufacturer, but it's our functional, you know, your typical space, you know, sidearm. When it comes to space toys, I found that it's getting harder and harder to collect. I bet. Their, the values skyrocketed. Every time I have, add a new piece to my collection, I have to increase the money I'm spending to make it a better collection. Right. And so it's a constant challenge from traveling the country to swap meets, antique stores, eBay. It's just it's a nonstop adventure. You've been collecting since you were a kid? Or? Yeah, on and off since I was a kid. Uh, seriously, the last 15 years, maybe. Cool. Currently, I'm on the hunt for a crazed astronaut. 
They were made in the 50s, they're battery operated. They value anywhere from three to four thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, What's the most expensive piece? That most you expensive have? piece I have would be Mr. Mercury. Wow. In this collection here, which is nice. in the two to three thousand range. Wow. There's lots of. Uh, there's a thing called the Atomic Racer. The Atomic Racer is the holy grail of tin toys to me. Oh yeah. It's a beautiful race car, the space age, with a little spaceman in it, and I've seen two. Actually, I've seen three. I've seen one that was rusted out of the neighbor's house that he wouldn't part with. One at an antique show where a lady was getting brought in and wanted to know what it was worth. And they appraised it for her. I offered to buy it on the spot for her. They appraised it. She wouldn't sell it. Then in the Oakland, in an antique store, I saw one about a month ago. And I was so excited. Got my credit card out. And I was going to buy the $3,000 atomic racer. But unfortunately, they brought it in the day before and it was already on layaway. Oh, brother. So, the Atomic Racer is the holy grail of antique tin toys. Cool. As far as I'm concerned. Now, I know having the packaging helps the value. Do I you have, have the packaging on the lot for these? I have the boxes to about 70% of them. Wow. And oftentimes they're yeah, you know, that's works the of art in themselves. Well, the too. problem is a lot of people will sell the box that they're damaged. I see. I also have, which I didn't bring, is a Tom Corbett 1946 play set. It's all metal with spaceships, aliens. Who was Tom Corbett? Tom Corbett was a space explorer in the 40s and 50s. They did lunch boxes of him. He had a oh. TV series, a cartoon. So he was kind of like the Buck Rogers of the 40s or 50s. Wow, neat. And that's in the box. And uh, that I actually bought from somebody who found it in the attic. Cool. There's, I can't value it.